Good morning and welcome. We'd like to welcome everyone that's here in the sanctuary with us today and all of those that are joining us uh, via Facebook from home. It is so nice to have a sunshiny day in spite of the cold this morning. Um, I'd like to start with our call to worship. I will start and you can follow. Come, let us worship. Teach us your ways, O Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Give us undivided hearts to revere your name. We give thanks to you, O Lord, our God, and we will glorify your name forever. Your love is great towards us. Merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Let us worship, let us praise, let us give thanks. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, your faithful love towards us never ends. It is as sure and dependable as the sky over our heads. We praise you. We've gathered together in this place to offer you our worship and our thanksgiving to declare to any who will listen that you are our God and we are your people. May your spirit be at work among us as we worship, opening our eyes to the light of your presence in this place. To you alone, faithful redeemer, creator, and sustainer, be all glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. Please stand and we'll sing hymn number 696, O oh God, you are my mighty, my God alone. this time of year, we, um, I say every year, often we do a stewardship campaign. It's a way of looking, uh, ending this year and looking towards the next year. And this week, actually, I was going to do uh, the kind of a standard stewardship sermon that I've been given for years and years. I, I borrowed it from a seminary professor, and I just really liked it, and I just totally steal it. And uh, I tell you that every year because I'm not trying to steal this stuff, but I am using it unabashedly. You're going to get a break this year because I couldn't figure out how to fit it in. But what you're not going to get a break from, <laughs> no. Uh, so we're going to ask everybody, everybody that wishes to respond, to consider again 
or to consider for the first time if you want to travel with us as a church for the next year or so. Now, the focus of a letter that you're going to get is on the church a little bit and its support, but it really introduces, because this idea of stewardship is much, much bigger than just what you do here at this congregation, or much bigger than your money or your volunteerism, all of which are valuable, thank you, but we really want you to kind of look at, at stewardship as a whole, all of our life given in service. So we're seeking to encourage and inspire a response. Not all you got to do, you're just going to be checking a box or two on a piece of paper, or you're going to be responding to us electronically, just to let us know that you're, that you're traveling with us for this next year or so, all right, of your intention to participate in the life of this church. So most of you will get an email this next year, and you can respond to that electronically, or you can text me on my phone. Discipleship may be costly. I'm going to talk about that a little later on. This is easy, all right? How much you put in the offering, how much you volunteer or sing or clean or cook or help out this coming year, that's all up to you. We just want to give you the opportunity to think and pray about it, and we're trying to see who, again, is kind of coming on board with us for the next little bit. Some of you will just get a letter. You will get a letter if you don't respond to the email in a timely fashion <laughs> or if we do not have your email address. Then the ante goes up. If you don't respond to the email and you don't respond to the letter, you're going to get a phone call. You don't respond to the phone call, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> now, if you want me to come to your house, I'm glad to do that. There's actually a box you can check in the email and in the letter to say, hey, I'd love to see Henry at my house, and I'll come and we'll talk. You'll be able to pick up this letter uh, and, uh, and uh, a response at church starting next Sunday. You can also just come to church and fill this stuff out and place it in the offering. Again, we're really, uh, we believe it is healthy spiritually and healthy for the organizational life of this church to do this on an annual basis. And uh, this is for members, for uh, people that are also here who maybe have not joined the church. This is for everybody online. If we can contact you, we're looking for some contact information. And again, just this affirmation of your intention in the next year or so. All right? We believe this is good for everybody involved. And it really does help those of us who plan stuff around here to get some information and to, to make plans. So. Anyway, you'll hear about this more this coming week. If, you don't, if you're getting an email from us on a weekly basis, there's going to be a little box to check, say, you've got my stuff, thank you. Don't need to put everything down. If you're not getting an email from me kind of once a week, then uh, you also have an envelope in, the, in your uh, bulletin today. This is for the Thanksgiving blessing, special offering that you can participate in. If you want to write your name and email on this envelope, we'll be able to get it and collect it and add that to our list. It's just a way that we send out something uh, mostly on a weekly basis. Also, I uh, want to remind you of the Thanksgiving blessing coming up this uh, Saturday. That's a community event, and uh, some of you will volunteer in that. If you want to make cookies or bring some candy to the church, you've got an opportunity to do that this week. There's some information about that in the bulletin. Next Sunday, there'll be soup available after the service. You can take it home, you can get it downstairs, um, and, uh, and there's, uh, oh, I, there was a list of like eight different kinds of soup. There's plenty of soup, and that's uh, next week. Dalton Morock will be preaching for us next week. Dalton was a youth pastor here for about seven years from 2007 to 2014, and he's coming back to help us celebrate 75 years, so he'll be with us next week as well. So come. And bring a friend. It is good to be with you this morning. Uh, let us stand and sing.
Do we have joys and concerns this morning? Yes, Janice. My Jody is really suffering from some anxiety and uh, nervousness, and it has been oppressive. And so relief uh, from that, we don't know what it's coming from, but that's okay. uh, Jody and Ed are both home from the hospital, recuperating from COVID, but Jody is having some anxiety issues and what have you, and so just just help for her and, and her anxiety at this time. Anyone else? Yes, Linda. Um, I don't uh, know uh, people here, I'm sure you, uh, Courtney Williams, uh, she died this past weekend. Uh, her husband, Dick, they were both school teachers in high school for many years. And uh, her husband died about a year ago and he passed, and so prayers for the family. Okay. That's Corky Williams passed. Uh, she was a teacher here at the high school, and uh, Linda's asking for prayers for her family. Any others this morning? Yes, Savannah. I have a second cousin down south who's a couple years older than me. She's having open heart surgery tomorrow at 12 noon. Prayers for Savannah's cousin who is having open heart surgery tomorrow at noon. Keep her in our prayers. Any others? Yes. Uh, Maria is our Morgan. She's doing fine. But... She had COVID and is doing fine now. Okay, Morgan. Uh, Maria's daughter Morgan had COVID and she's she's doing well now. But just prayers for her for continued continued healing. Do we have any others? I would like to let everyone know I did talk to Andrea this week, and she is getting better little by little. She says she's navigating the house pretty well right now, but not quite ready to try navigating the church with her walker yet. But she is on the way to recovery, so we look forward to having her back here with us again soon. Okay. Lord... We come to you today with joy, sadness, prayers for healing. We lift up Jody and Ed as they're finally home from the hospital and recovering from COVID and pray that they'll be able to figure out why Jody is having such issues with anxiety and help her with this. Prayers for the family of Corky Williams who passed away. Uh, They've lost her husband not long ago, and now they've lost Corky. So just, just hold them up, Lord, and comfort them as they deal with the passing. Uh, surgeries, open heart surgery, and many other surgeries this week. Also, prayers of thanksgiving for surgeries last week that went well. Both Linda Fry and um, Cindy Ryberg had knee surgery, and both of them are doing, doing quite well right now. We lift Morgan up to you. Thank you, Lord, that uh, she's on the mend after her COVID. We all know so many that have, have dealt with COVID over the last several months, and we just are so thankful when we hear that someone is on the mend. Lord, we lift all of these up to you as we repeat the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and uh, just reading a few verses from that chapter. I'm, uh, I'm kind of skipping over some verses that I'll refer to. The whole text would be kind of 25 through 33, but uh, I'm just going to refer to some of those texts and, and read other parts of it. Um, this is Luke 14, 25 and 27, and then verse 33 that kind of wraps up the whole text. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, turning to the crowds, Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife, his children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Going kind of down to the end of the text. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Large crowds. Very popular. This is during this Galilean ministry. He's doing healings. He's teaching. He's doing miracles. He has begun teaching the cross and discipleship to the disciples, but to this point he has not mentioned it to the crowds. These crowds are following after him. They just want to touch the robe of his garment. They're looking to be fed. He's fed the 5,000. They're looking to be healed. They're looking to lay out all these things at Jesus' feet. And he turns to them. If you want to follow me, hate your family. Now, it just sounds super harsh to our ears, all right? I mean, it sits back and goes, wait a minute. Is that what did he say? It's drawn out. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, and he mentions father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even our own life, they cannot be my disciples. You don't carry your cross. You cannot be my disciple. Now, there was, Jesus is, is pretty famous and pretty, pretty normal that he would use hyperbole or he would, say, would overstate something to make his case, and perhaps he's doing that here. But I think he's also really just using a, an old Jewish saying. He's using an old way that, and you can see it in the Old Testament, and you can see it in other places in Jewish writings. It was not unusual for them to say, I choose this, but I hate this. Isaac is known to be said, he said, I love Jacob, but I hate Esau. And what he was saying is, I choose Jacob, or Jacob gets the blessing, Esau does not. Okay? Uh, Later on, Jacob says, I love Rachel, but I hate Esau. Rahab, uh, Leah, excuse me, uh, and uh, so it's a way of saying I'm choosing one, and I'm not choosing the other. You're for, you're choosing one, and you're forsaking the other. So Jesus is very plainly saying, if you don't forsake family, if you don't forsake your own life, if you don't forsake all these earthly possessions, you really can't be my disciple. This is an all-or-nothing text. This is not a text about balance. It's not a text about, well, if I just get everything straightened out and get my religion and my priorities straight, then everything else in my life will follow suit. It's really not that text. (laughs) This is a text about getting everything straight. (laughs) Your priorities and your all-in to follow Jesus Christ. And he compares it to taking up a cross And then he's got a couple other illustrations that I'll talk about here in just a moment. Discipleship means forsaking all other masters. It's a way of saying to forsake everything else, to choose Jesus the Christ, to choose following and being that disciple. Discipleship means nothing comes before following. Not family, not career, not our personal interest, not our stuff. Not even life. 
Discipleship means carrying a cross like Jesus carried a cross. We too must submit. That's what Jesus did when he carried the cross. He submitted his will to his Father's will. He submitted his own good to the will of his Father and for the good of humankind. We must humble ourselves as Christ did who humbled himself and did not count equality with God something to be held tightly to or grasped, but rather emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, even to death on the cross. We need to submit and we need to be humble. And we need to sacrifice. (laughs) Jesus sacrificed himself. We talk about it at the Lord's Supper in particular, but we remember God's sacrifice of his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent the son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's what discipleship accomplishes. He speaks of it in each gospel, and then shows what it means by his life, death, and resurrection. Our faith in Christ... Our following of Christ is not just the first thing on our list. It is what reorganizes the list. It's not just the first duty of my faith or my life. It is that duty and commitment which brings, uh, which makes right all other duty and commitment. Our faith redefines how we live, how we love. It redefines how I'm a husband. It redefines how I'm a parent redefines my work and service in this congregation. It it redefines how I play, how I entertain myself, how I spend my time, my money, and my energy. It is not just one thing among others or even the most important thing among others. It is what redefines and shapes and fashions everything else. That is following as a disciple. Jesus wanted that crowd to follow. No doubt about it. He really was interested in them following. It is what he continued to do. He said, repent and be a part of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is here in my presence. Learn from me. Follow me. Take my yoke upon you. He wanted them to follow, but he also needed them to count the cost. He needed them not just to want to be fed and not just to be thirsty, and not just to have miracles be performed, and not just to be healed. All those are great things, and he's willing and able to do those things in our lives. But he needed them to count the cost. Just like a a person building a tower, (laughs) that's the next illustration in this text, what person among you builds, you know, figures out how to build something, they want to build a tower, and they don't first sit down and figure out the cost so they don't get halfway built. Alaskans blue tarps aside. When I looked at that, I said, eh, maybe that's not a good illustration for Alaskans. <laughs> There's a group coming to Bingo Camp this summer, and they're willing to do some work for us, but they have asked us to prioritize that list, and they've asked us, are we going to have the money before they agree to do the work? So we're counting the cost and figuring out if we're going to be able to have this group come. What king or ruler among you would go to war and not look at the troop strength and find out if this war is worth waging? And then if it's not, if you're on the short end of that troop count, then you go to that king and you make peace. Jesus wants the crowd, and he wants you and I too, because this text comes to us in the same fashion. He wants you and I to count the cost. He wants you and I to understand what we're getting into when we say, I want to be a follower. I want to go that direction. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You don't have to know everything. We don't have to know where it's going to lead, but we do have to know what the next step means. Some of you have taken this step and you've been involved in it so long you've kind of forgotten maybe what it, what it means. And that's, that's okay, by the way. I'm glad for your faithfulness. But every so often it's good to remind ourselves what it means to follow Christ, what it means to take up that cross, what it means to forsake everything else. Now the good news is all of that 
comes back. All of that gets rearranged. Forsaking my family means that I can love and serve my family better than I could in my own will and my own strength. Forsaking my work and turning it over to Jesus and being a follower of Christ means that I'm going to work in the church better and with a clearer vision than I would if it was just built upon my smarts and my abilities. That's the good news. Jesus says, take my yoke, yes, but my yoke is easy and it fits right. Jesus wanted that crowd and he wanted to understand what it means because he knew what was coming. He knew he was going to turn towards Jerusalem fairly quickly. He knew he was going to be turned over to people and beaten and killed. Now, he'd already told the disciples this and they clearly did not understand. Now he's telling the crowd, and I'm sure they were wondering what he meant. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, was a German theologian, German Christian uh, in, the, in the days of World War II and leading up to World War II, and, uh, and teaches us concerning discipleship and also teaches us concerning what he called costly grace and cheap grace. He did this in a book called The Cost of Discipleship. You can still get it at the local bookstore. I'm sure you can get it on Amazon and delivered to your door. Um, and probably even as an ebook. It's still very worth reading. But in The Cost of Discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this He says, The cross is laid on every Christian. And the first Christ suffering which every person must experience is the call to abandon attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old, which is the result of their encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death, and thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life. Rather, it, is, it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. The cross is not the end. It is the beginning of discipleship. This is the quotable quote. When Christ calls a person or a man, he bids him come and die. If we're preaching a discipleship without sacrifice, if we're preaching a discipleship without death to old, without repentance, without grace, we have made a mistake. It may be a death like that of the first disciples who had to leave home and work to follow him. Or it may be a death like Luther's who had to leave the monastery and go out into the world. But it is the same death every time. It is the death to the old self and a living into Christ. The death of the old man at his call. Bonhoeffer also talks about costly grace and cheap grace. He says cheap grace is what we bestow upon ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. It is baptism without church discipline. It is communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace, on the other side, is the treasure hidden in the field and for the sake of it, a person will gladly go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price, which the merchant will sell all his goods to go and get. It is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out his eye, which causes him to stumble. All of these are, are um, parables that Jesus taught that are uh, overstatements for the purpose of making the point. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. It is the discipleship which says, I will forsake my family, hate my mother and father, and brothers and sisters, and all that I have to follow Christ. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again. It is the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a person must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. It is grace 
because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a person their life. It is grace because it gives a person the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God his son. And it it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up. The Cost of Discipleship, uh, Bonhoeffer. It's not an easy book to read, but it's a book well worth reading. And it reminds us that grace may be free, but it's not cheap. Again, Bonhoeffer quote, Grace is free, but not cheap. Let us pray. Lord, you call us to leave behind the old, to confess our sins and to need, uh, to thirst, to hunger for you. And then you come. And you grant us grace and forgiveness and life, even life everlasting. Allow us the courage, allow us the the spirit to let us let go of the old and rejoice and live in the new. Allow us to forsake and to put away that which holds us back and clings so closely. And let us follow your light in life into this day and all the days that follow. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Once again, we'd like to thank everyone for their... uh, their stewardship and their giving to our church. Um, at this time, we're still not passing the trays but, or the plates, but we do have them in the bank, back of the sanctuary for anyone that would like to leave an offering with us this morning. I'd like to remind you that in your bulletins is the uh, envelopes for the Thanksgiving blessing. If you would like to help out with that this year, you can go ahead and... Uh, And do that for those of you at home that would like to help with the Thanksgiving blessing. You're more than welcome to mail a check to the church. Um, And you can also do your offerings through a check in the mail or uh, through the e-giving on our website. Uh, (laughs) Last week during Table Talk, Henry had made the comment that he was going to be preaching on Jesus telling us to uh, hate our mothers and fathers. So I thought, boy, I better do some reading this week. (laughs) And I spent quite a bit of time reading the scripture and some commentaries. And in that time, I came across a prayer that I'd like to share with you today. It is from Prayers Plain and Simple by Mark and Jill Herringshaw. Father, you have promised to protect me, deliver me, keep me from death, shield me from calamity, command angelic charge over me, Grant me victory from my enemy. Answer me and help me in times of trouble and to give me a rich and long and satisfying life, showing me your salvation along the way. These magnificent promises are particularly realized in areas of my life, but there is one gapping hole, one thorn in my flesh in which I have yet to discover victory. I lay all other questions and requests aside now as I seek just this one thing. May I be granted the grace to love you more. Give me the understanding to know your love and to return love to you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want to love you from my heart. I want my emotions to be engaged in my worship. I want to want to love you. I want my thoughts to reflect how much I love you, my God, and I want my day-to-day actions to show forth a love for you 
that is genuine and growing daily. I believe I receive the answer to this request. I am expecting your help as I purposely engage in loving you from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. And now Elaine's going to play the organ, and I, I ask that you just sit here and meditate a little bit on what Henry has had to say to us this morning. actually going to be 7-11. We had a misprint there. Okay. <laughs> it's one that I sent to her. You guys got the right one.
O God, to mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen to your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Christ now begins. 